Good evening, everyone, and welcome. When the year 1862 began, as Stephen Sears writes in our new book, The Best of Battles and Leaders of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was, as he told a council of generals that he convened at the White House, greatly disturbed by the state of affairs. The Treasury was nearly exhausted. Public credit was evaporating. Congress was full of Jacobins, as he said. <laughs> Foreign relations were perilous. Generals Halleck and Buell were spending more time fighting each other than fighting the Confederates. In Missouri and in the East, General George McClellan was sick in bed with typhoid fever, incommunicado, his army stalemated, inspiring Lincoln's famous comment, if General McClellan did not want to use the army, maybe he could borrow it for a while. If something was not done soon, Lincoln confided, the bottom would be out of the whole affair. 1862 may have been, in a way, the most dizzying year of the war. Before it was over, things for the Union got better, then worse, then better, then worse. And within its roller coaster of triumphs and disasters, Abraham Lincoln did nothing less than transform the war for Union into a war for Union and freedom. And that was a pretty breathtaking uh, turn of events. We wanted to explore that year today with an emphasis on the extraordinary battle of Antietam that, that did so much to transform America in many ways. Let's go back a couple of days before the battle. September 15th, 1862, Lincoln wired to McClellan, destroy the rebel army if possible. Two days later, uh, in a ba after a battle widely reported in the press as a major Union victory, the commander-in-chief issued no congratulations that I've ever seen to the army, but a few days later, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, began nagging McClellan again to go into action. And he wrote this amazing letter to a Quaker leader, confiding his belief that America was going through a fiery trial, which God permitted to continue, as he put it, for some wise purpose of his own mysterious and unknown tonight. Well, among James McPherson's landmark books on the Civil War is Crossroads of Freedom, Antietam, the Battle That Changed America, in which he wrote, in a war with several crucial turning points, the Battle of Antietam was the pivotal moment for the, the, the most crucial of them all. And in his unsurpassed biography, George McClellan, The Young Napoleon, Stephen Sears described Antietam as the opportunity of a lifetime for the general and for the Union alike, which McClellan squandered by losing, and I quote, his inner composure, and with it, the courage to command under the press of combat. Strong words about an extraordinary moment, and tonight we'd like to drill down to these still unresolved questions of what was lost and what was gained in 1862. Let's back up first a little bit uh, things were looking up for the Union in the spring, Shiloh in the west, the Monitor driving off the Merrimack, New Orleans in April, a disaster at Manassas, but above all, before Antietam, there was the Peninsula Campaign. Steve, harebrained or a really brilliant plan that had a reasonable chance of conquering Richmond and ending the war? Well, McClellan thought it was going to be very much uh, he thought the war would be over. He, uh, the, his famous letter to Lincoln after the failure of the seven days, he had actually drafted before all the seven days started, and he was planning to uh, reassume the, the role of commander-in-chief, general-in-chief, I should say, and uh, he expected to be writing this letter from Richmond. So he was very, much, very optimistic until, until the seven days, until Lee attacked him. Jim Lee emerged during this campaign. Almost overnight, it seemed, Granny Lee became the successful defender of the Confederacy. Was he a, a sleeping giant that was allowed to slumber too long by Jefferson Davis? Well, no, I don't think so, because uh, Lee's experience in the 
first year of the war had been a succession of failures. Uh, after he had helped to mobilize the Virginia troops and then had joined the Confederacy, uh, when Virginia finally did join the Confederacy, uh, he had been sent out to deal with a problem in the western part of Virginia, which became West Virginia, uh, where McClellan actually had overseen a uh, successful uh, Union occupation of much of that area. Uh, then McClellan was called to Washington in July, and Lee was sent out to Western Virginia to try to recover that area in August of 1861. Uh, and uh, every effort he made turned out to be a failure. He came, into, uh, came under all kinds of criticism from the Richmond newspapers. He was called Granny Lee, as you suggest. Uh, then in uh, November of 1861, Jefferson Davis sent him to the South Atlantic coast, to Charleston, uh, just in time for Lee to witness the uh, capture of uh, Port Royal by the Union Navy and the occupation of the South Carolina and the Georgia Sea Islands by Union forces, another major uh, reverse for the Confederacy. Uh, and Lee had to try to deal with um, what, uh, what was going to be the consequence of that. And he gave orders to pull back uh, out of range of the Union Navy all along the coastline, uh, which was seen as another major retreat by the Confederacy. So. It's not that Lee was some kind of a sleeping uh, giant uh, whose talents were not recognized. He actually had, um, had not really succeeded in doing anything. He was called back to Richmond in March of 1862, became a uh, military advisor to Jefferson Davis, and then began fashioning the Confederate strategy of a counteroffensive, first with Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley, and then after Joe Johnston was wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines. Uh, Lee was given direct command of what he renamed the Army of Northern Virginia, and that's when the Lee uh, greatness really starts and the Lee legend really starts. But up until that time, uh, no, Robert E. Lee was kind of an also ran. Let me ask you both a question then. Um, he's the successful counteroffensive general, the defender of the capital. As we, as we march toward the fall of 1862, why did Robert E. Lee change a winning formula and decide to go on the offensive and march into Maryland? Steve, let's start with you. Well, he really didn't have much choice. Uh, after Second Bull Run, he could go four directions, literally the four directions of, of the compass. And if he went toward Washington, he had not the uh, arms or the heavy artillery to besiege Washington. And if he went back south, he was admitting that his uh, plan, his offensive plan, had failed. If he went west into the Shenandoah Valley, he could supply his men, but he couldn't, he would just be marking time and he would lose the advantage, the initiative. So he ended up going north uh, where there was a lot of food and a lot of, uh, they thought they would raise Marylanders to join this Confederate cause, which didn't turn out to be true. But he really didn't, he couldn't stay still. And he had to go, this was to his best option. Jim? Well, I think uh, Lee was always a, an avid reader of Northern newspapers and a uh, follower of Northern politics. And he was well aware that congressional elections were scheduled for October and November of 1862. Uh, and he even wrote to Jefferson Davis saying that by invading Maryland, uh, and as he hoped, inflicting another defeat on the Army of the Potomac, maybe on the scale of uh, Second Manassas, uh, that he could actually influence that election. Uh, and maybe the Democrats would gain control of the House and force the Lincoln administration to, uh, to uh, negotiate for, for peace. Um, also, at the same time, we need to remember that the war is taking place not only in Virginia, uh, but across a front of a thousand miles, and the Confederates were on the offensive in the Western Theater, too, where General Braxton Bragg and General Edmund Kirby Smith were invading Kentucky, uh, also with the idea of winning that border state for the Confederacy. So when Lee went across the Potomac River into Maryland in the first week of September 1862, Confederate uh, soldiers were on the march elsewhere. Uh, with the hope of, uh, in effect, I think, uh, conquering a peace by forcing the Lincoln administration to, uh, to negotiate with them. 
Also, Lee's uh, personality, his character, 